Um, let me just tell you, um, this is this is really what you guys want it to be. Uh, I do want to absolutely open it up for questions. I have a short presentation I'm going to try to go through quickly. And then, um, you know, if you joined because you had questions about where to go, that's great. Um, I'm also going to be using the, uh, I don't know, maybe you've seen it or you've downloaded it. I'm not sure. I have a free ebook that I created called Where to Go and When. Um, so I kind of use that as a guide. Just recently, um, actually, I'm actually in the middle of it. I am updating that guide. It's a free download on my website. Um, and because <laughs> some of the places I actually originally created it during the pandemic, uh, cause I had the time and, um, some of the places are no longer relevant because places like Russia, you can't really go anymore. So I found that I needed to get back there and update that. So, uh, we'll kind of use that as a little bit of a guide. I'll go through a few ideas there because I have, um, ideas for every month of the year, and then we will open it up to questions after that. And then, um, and if you have questions in the meantime, you can put them in the chat and I'll try to kind of monitor that too. Um, and then at the end, if you're still here, I am going to do a little giveaway. I've got like, I've got a whole box of like gear that I just kind of have on hand. So we will draw a winner and you can pick from a few different things, whichever you like. So, hey, is that Vicky? I think Vicky just joined. Yay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hi, Vic. Uh, so a few people that I know here and a lot of people that I don't, but I'm so happy you joined me. Thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen and go through the little presentation that I have. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Um, oh, that is not where I want to be though. Hold on a second. <laughs> Would help if I was actually at the beginning. Yeah, we'll try that. Okay. Can people see this? I hope. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay. So where to go and when. Uh, as I said, this kind of comes from the ebook that I wrote. I will say all of these places that I'm discussing uh are places that I've personally been to. So I don't really cover things that I haven't done. And even though I've traveled a lot for the past 17 years, I still haven't been everywhere. So I'm sure that you're going to have a question about a place that I might not have been. And I'll just tell you, I haven't been there. Um, but uh, this will give you some ideas. Also, I'm going to share some tips on, um, on how to find unique places and ways to just think about that a little bit. Uh, so I know this is a really old picture and I don't know if you can make it out or not, but if you can, I would love to know if you have any ideas of where this is at. Trevi Fountain. Very good. I don't know who said, oh, Pam, maybe. Yes. So this is Trevi Fountain in probably 1950 something. This is an, a picture that my father took when he mm -hmm. was uh, in the service. He was stationed over in Germany after the war and he had a leave. And I somehow came across all these old pictures because he and his buddies went to Rome and they had all these pictures. And this was stunning to me because there is no one there, <laughs> um, which was just mind boggling to me because this is what it normally looks like. Um, so <laughs> yeah, if anyone's been there lately. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, don't go there go there, but just know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and that's the thing is that's why I kind of wanted to have this talk, this quick talk is my passion is um, unique off the beaten track travel. Uh, and that is, it's sort of because of who I am, but also I would much rather go to places that don't look like this. And there are places that are just wonderful that we just don't know about because people haven't talked about them yet. So that's what I want to kind of bring up and I want to bring up alternatives and stuff like that to get you thinking, how can I go off the beaten track, escape stuff like this, or maybe you go to stuff like this for a day, but then, you know, there's other places you can go. That's not going to look so busy. So over tourism is definitely real and it is back in full force. Um, so this is my own personal motto. You may have heard me say it before, but this is how I look at many, many things in my life. I see where everyone's going and then I turn around and go the other way. I 
that's pretty much how I've set up my whole life. So that's why this is so important and passionate to me. Um, one of the things that I would say is when I think of traveling off the beaten track, I think about getting in that explorer mindset. I love reading books about explorers and stuff like that too. But the idea that it is, you know, a person where you're traveling to a place that is not well known, that you're exploring it, you're discovering it. Um, and for me, that brings me a lot of joy. That might not be the same for everyone, but that's kind of why I also started blogging and doing this 17 years ago and starting to share this stuff with people. Um, because I wanted other people to know that there's a lot of other cool things out there other than what we're just fed. Okay, so a few tips on how to find unique travel destinations. These are things I all use. Um, one thing I would say first is start to think of, I mean, everyone wants to go to national parks and lots of our national parks now, at least in the US have reservation systems, which can be kind of annoying, but also really good in a way. Um, but you can also just go to state parks or lesser visited national parks. And I'm going to be talking about a few of those lesser visited national parks in, um, in some of the ideas of where to go. Um, but, you know, I think of places, we have like 63 national parks basically in the U S and I would say probably most people know about 15 and those are the ones they want to go to, um, places like in California, like Lassen, national park it's a volcano it's volcanoes and it's so beautiful and different and no one knows about it um there are so many parks in alaska that we're going to talk about a little bit besides denali even in my own home state colorado um if you've never been to black canyon of the gunnison it is stunning and so few people are there and you can camp and hike and it kind of looks like the grand canyon but no crowds so Make sure that there, there are a ton of articles out there on lesser visited national parks. I've probably written a few, um, but things to consider. Also going during shoulder seasons. So I had, I said this to someone, I don't know, a few months ago, and they didn't know what a shoulder season was. So um, it's basically the off season. So for example, um, if you go to Europe in July or August, it is going to be very crowded and prices are gonna be higher and it's gonna be harder to get into things, obviously. But if you go in the fall or in the like April, you'll have the place to yourself practically. So shoulder seasons are generally when I travel um, because I just like fewer people and, and lower prices, which I'm sure many people probably do. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those ideas too. So basically also what that means is I'm not saying you shouldn't go to Paris. But going to Paris potentially in August is going to be much different than going in, say, January, which might be colder, but that's OK. Um, so shoulder seasons or off seasons are really great. Take a popular destination and find a new area within it. So this kind of comes back to that explorer mindset, um, for me at least. So for example, I went to Germany a number of years ago. And you know everyone goes to Berlin or um, uh, maybe Munich or whatever, you know, the big cities. And I ended up in a, uh, one of the areas called Thuringia, which most people have never heard of. And we were talking about this earlier before we started, but it's kind of the middle of Germany. It's the Midwest of Germany. <laughs> and I love it. And that's where the bratwurst was like first created and, and eaten. There's a whole bunch of stuff that was done there. And so sometimes you just have to push yourself to go to a different place that maybe you've never heard of. And you can find a bunch of really great stuff there. And for me, discovering Turingia was like a super treat for me. Like I felt like I was an explorer. Like I was introducing this to people who had, didn't know anything about it, that hadn't really gone past Berlin. Um, uh, be willing to go in any kind of weather. So this kind of also comes back to shoulder season stuff. Um, I get questions quite a lot on like things like, uh, you know, I want to go to Japan, but I don't want to go in the rainy season. And I say, go in the rainy season. Um, once again, less people, uh, cheaper, but even more so if you kind of go in with that explorer mindset, then being willing to go in any kind of weather means that you're going to learn about how that local culture operates in that inclement weather. So for example, in Vietnam, I used to live there. 
Um, I loved rainy season because I would just sit out and watch the people ride their motorbikes through pouring rain. And I would be amused by all of the different types of ponchos that they wore. <laughs> Um, and that's not something you're going to see if you only go, you know, in the popular season or whatever. So it's just kind of like really finding joy in all kinds of new stuff. Um, so if you, if anyone asked me like, should I go to X in winter or whatever? I'm going to say, yeah, probably, because you'll probably find some really cool stuff there that you, that will surprise you and other people won't know about. Um, go by a different or less used form of transportation. Um, I am a transportation addict. I love going on different types of transportation, but also typically, you know, when you take a local bus or you take a local ferry, you're also going at a much slower speed. Um, so you have a chance to see a lot more and immerse yourself a lot more, which I think is really important. Um, and be open to changing your itinerary based on local recommendations. Um, I always recommend no matter where you go to the first day you're there, if you've never been there before, uh, hire a local guide and have them take you around and you can ask questions because that is the fastest way to get up to speed and get local recommendations on where to eat, where to go, where do the locals eat breakfast, where, you know, like all of that stuff. And so I also talk about a lot about taking food tours and stuff that first day, because then you can learn about the local food. Um, but that local guide stuff, I think is really, really important. Um, I will just, as a side note at the end of this, probably tomorrow, I will send out an email to everyone who registered with some of, uh, my best links for like local guides, um, you know, different companies. I also have some stuff on discounts about some of the companies that I'm going to be talking about and so on. So I will send some of that. Okay, let's see. I just want to make sure we don't have any questions. Um, okay, we look good. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm going to go through a few months and then um, we will, we'll do that and we'll get to some questions for whatever you guys have. So January, you guys probably already have your plans for January. So I'll kind of go over this quickly. But um, the other thing I guess to know is in this book that I that I wrote, I have three places for every month of the year. One is an epic trip. One is a international or festival trip. One is a domestic US trip. Um, so you have different types of ideas, different budgets and price points. Obviously, the epic trips are epic. Like... They are going to be more money. They're probably further away and harder to get to, but they're probably something that might be on your bucket list for someday. So um, so obviously Antarctica is one of those epic trips. And the reason why I put this up here is um, the Ross Sea. So there's two ways to get to Antarctica. You can go the way that everyone goes, which is from Ushuaia, which is the southern tip of South America, down to the peninsula of Antarctica, and that, I think, I don't know, last I checked, it was like 30,000 or so people a year go that way on small ships. Um, however, you can also go, and this gets back to exploring, the way of the explorers, which is from New Zealand. So you can go from New Zealand all the way over to Antarctica. It is a longer trip, I will say that. It might even be rougher. Um, but you go to the Ross Sea. And at the time when I went and did this, only 500 people a year went that way. So... Just this kind of idea of, you know, trying to go the lesser travel way, lesser traveled way. Um, we didn't see anyone else. I didn't even see another ship. <laughs> so, so that was really cool. Anyway, uh, and I did that with heritage expeditions. So over to February, Alaska. So if you followed me at all, you know that I love Alaska in the winter. And I like it in the winter because of one of those things that I talked about before, inclement weather. Most people would be like, nope, don't want to do Alaska in the winter. It's way too cold. But it's darn fun. Um, I run trips there myself. I'm not doing one this year. I did one last year. I'll do one in 2025. Uh, but I, it is, for me, out of all the places I've gone, the best place to see Aurora. Um, you have the highest percentage to see it, I would say. You can do all those awesome things like learn how to mush your own team of dogs, do glacier hiking, 
snowshoeing, all that stuff. So very active outdoor stuff. Um, and it's a little bit cheaper, I would say, than going to like Iceland or Norway to see the Northern Lights. So it's a really great alternative. Um, it was really great during COVID because it was the US, so it was easy, we could go, uh, but it's still pretty easy. And and that tourism, I would say in the winter for them is increasing all the time. So um, there are more flights and stuff like that, but it's still not anything like summer in Alaska. Summer in Alaska is a completely different world. So, uh, okay, this is one of my new ones that I added. So if you follow me, you might've seen that last, I did this last October, but I'm putting it in here for March. Um, uh, an e-bike trip in Patagonia. This was probably one of the best trips I've ever been on in my life. Like this is definitely an epic trip. Um, it's an active outdoor trip, which you know that I love. And it is super unique because most people, when you go to Patagonia, you're probably going to go to the big national parks, Torres del Paine mainly, and you're probably going to hike. And I love hiking and I've hiked there, but um, my one complaint actually about hiking in Argentina or in uh, Chile in Torres del Paine is that it's beautiful, but you don't get a lot of interaction with culture. And for me, when I hike, I, I like both of that. Um, so the great thing about this trip is you actually bike all around the outside of the park. So you have incredible views of the park and you're biking from ranch to ranch or estancia to estancia. And that means all of the culture, like the the um, the cowboy culture, the um, all that stuff, the gauchos. That's what I'm thinking of. The gaucho culture is out in these grasslands. They are the people that started Patagonia. They are the people that still live there. And so, what you're doing is biking from ranch to ranch, and you're meeting all these um, gauchos and families who have lived there for hundreds of years and eating, you know, their great barbecues and so on. So to me, this was the perfect blend of completely off the beaten track. There was no one out here, um, no one else biking and, you know, being able to get that dose of culture, but also get the beautiful landscapes of Patagonia all at the same time. It's e-bikes. So it was also pretty easy, I would say. Um, but anyway, that was a perfect one. This is also one that I am working on an Ots World Tour for. It's either going to be late this year or in March of 2025. We'll see. Um, and the reason why I say March on this is uh, it is when the, because that's summer, obviously in Patagonia, but it's kind of the end of summer. And I was told that it is the best time to be on a bike because the winds are the lowest then. So that is why it sits in March. The only other thing I would say here too is that one of the coolest things was all of the animals. So the, the herds of wild horses, the guanacos, the um, different birds and sheep, they had never seen bikes before because people don't bike out there. So it was so cool because these herds of horses would like stop and look at us and then they'd run along with us for a while and then they'd stop and look at us again. They just, they had never seen bikes so they didn't quite know what we were. So that's how untouched it is. Um, and that's why it was so special for me. Another great March alternative that's not epic, but really, really great is um, Sea of Cortez. And this is actually in Mexico. It is between the Baja Peninsula and the like main part of Mexico. Um, and I always list this. I did this with a company called Uncruise. Um, it's a small ship. Uh, it is. It would be considered expedition cruising. You are not going to get to these areas except for by like sailboat or ship like this, many of them. Um, and it's only like 70 people on the ship. So that part's nice. I am not a big ship person. So this kind of stuff though, I like, cause it takes me to really remote areas. And the Sea of Cortez is lovely. It's kind of like, it's very, very similar actually to the Galapagos. Uh, tons of wildlife that is quite untouched. Um, lots of the same environment, I would say also. So here you can do hiking and stand up paddleboarding and canoeing and horseback riding and snorkeling and whale watching and all of that. So this is a rather economical trip to take in the winter, I think. And it's a really great way to see a different part of Mexico that you probably never even considered. <laughs> so, and it's nothing like what you 
would probably think Mexico is either, I would say. That's a fun one. Um, here's another epic trip uh, for people that like the cold again, but I like the winter. Uh, up in the Canadian Arctic, we've got our, I know we have one Canadian with us, um, in the Canadian Arctic in an area way up north where the Arctic Ocean is, basically. I did this a few years ago, and I went to see this reindeer, reindeer crossing. Um, it's like a herd of a couple thousand reindeers, um, and they move the reindeer, they herd them across the river, which is ice, and move them to their spring feeding grounds. And it is kind of one of these once in a lifetime, like migration type experiences. Um, so that is one of the days. There's also at that time of year, a really great festival called the Muskrat Festival. That's where that man is dancing there in that one image. Um, so you get really ingrained in the culture. The picture of me with the Arctic Ocean, that is actually an ice road that goes over the Arctic Ocean. That is, I'm standing on the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> and the ice roads are fascinating. This is why I like going in different weather, because it, it's just fascinating to me that they make a whole like super highway out of frozen rivers in the Arctic Ocean. Like that's really unique. Another thing we did in this was we built an igloo and slept in it, like with our own hands, which is much harder than you would think. <laughs> um, so really cool. Um, you can fly up there. You don't have to go by ship, you know, but a really, really interesting area. Another April, a very unknown place. If you don't like cold and you want heat um, in the Caribbean, there is an island called Seba. It's actually part of the Netherlands. It is a small five square mile island. It looks like King Kong lives there. Um, it is just kind of a volcano that shoots up, you know, but there's this very small community that lives there uh, and it is quirky and unique, like beyond belief. And it is the only island in the Caribbean that doesn't have a beach, which is why I love it because that means that not as many people go there or have even heard of it. <laughs> um, and there's great, great hiking. So for me, I'm a hiker. This was perfect. And the people are so interesting and quirky. It also, uh, you'll see the one picture there. It is the home of the smallest commercial runway in the world. Um, and it, it was, it was very fun to land there. It was not scary, but it is small. <laughs> it's like an aircraft carrier, but the pilots are great. Um, so that's a really fun one. In May, I put in here the Camino de Santiago. Now, this is a very popular thing to do. I know that. But in May, it's not so popular. I actually did it when I hiked this myself. I did this in April and May. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was spring. So I got to see spring come alive over the course of a month. Uh, I walked this whole thing at once. So it was like 500 miles. So it took like five weeks or something. Um, but this is a, a super time of year to do it. It might be a little rainy and muddy, but that's okay. Um, like I said, one of my favorite parts was seeing, being outside every day for four or five weeks in the spring and watching a whole landscape develop in the spring was really fascinating to me. Um, also fewer people, cheaper. This is probably, and I've said this to many people, this is probably one of the cheapest ways you could travel through Europe. Um, even though this is kind of an epic long distance hike, you don't have to do the whole thing. But if you are willing to stay the way that like the pilgrims do, the hikers do in the albergs and so on and so forth, and they've got cheaper meals for people who are hiking, like it is a really economical way to travel in Europe. And even though it's just Northern Spain, there are so many people from all parts of the world that you're going to meet, you will feel like you've gone to more than Spain, which is the other kind of cool part. So it used to be when I did this, which was probably 10 years ago, I would say you could do it on $30 a day. It's probably gone up by now. Um, but just to give you kind of an idea. So that's a nice kind of budget option in a way, but active. Also May, domestic, this one's an easy one, Northern California road trip. Um, most people stick to the uh, Highway 1 between LA and San Francisco, we all know it. But if you've ever gone north out of San Francisco, it is stunning and not nearly as many people on Highway 1. It's still Highway 1 and it's still beautiful. Um, 
one of the biggest surprising things to me along that route, along that section, kind of all the way up to the Oregon border, and I would say beyond, because the Oregon coast, that southern Oregon coast, is also spectacular and not that traveled. Um, but one of the most surprising things were all the lighthouses. It was like Maine. It was crazy to me. Um, you've got all these beautiful lighthouses. Some of them you can stay in. Uh, you know, so you got some really great views. Also down in the bottom right hand corner, you will see um, the giant redwoods. Uh, you can easily stop also in one of those kind of lesser visited national parks, the Redwoods National Park, um, which is really beautiful. I did that trip in a camper van that I rented. And so I like camped in the park and it, it was a fabulous trip. So and I just did that by myself in the camper van. So um. May also Costa Brava, Spain, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, May is a perfect time to go. It is, if you wanted to go to that same place in say July or August, I would say no, because all of Europe goes there. But May, it's still relatively quiet. Um, the water uh, along the coast may not be as warm, but that's okay. Um, it's still beautiful and the fishing villages are, be are beautiful. What I always say, Costa Brava to me is like the alternative to Tuscany, Italy. Tuscany, we all know, is super popular. Lots of people go there. It can be very crowded and expensive. Costa Brava, Spain, which is in the northern part of Spain, just north of Barcelona up to the border of France. Um, it, you've heard Catalonia. That's the Catalonia region, basically is just stunning. And it has all those same things, incredible wine, some of the best restaurants in the world, lots of Michelin stars. So great food, um, this beautiful coastline um, and medieval towns and big villas that you can rent and so on. I've sent, I've recommend many families to go there, like for a family, like rent a villa trip because it's, it's cheaper and less crowded than Tuscany and just as interesting. Um, also, you may recognize Costa Brava because I was there and did a, another long distance hike there called the Camita Ronda, 130 miles, basically from kind of the southern part of Catalonia all the way up to the border of France, all along the, the coast. It's a beautiful, beautiful hike. Not many people know about it yet. It's becoming more popular all the time, I would say, but it's, it, it's a great option. And I actually hiked it in May. Um, over the course of like two or three weeks. So it was, and it's a little harder than the Camino de Santiago, I would say. So if you're interested in that and you ever have any questions about the Cami de Ronda, I'm happy to answer them. I actually wrote an ebook on it. <laughs> um, June, this is a perfect time to go to Norway because Norway is just opening up for the summer. So you're just hitting that beginning of their season or maybe the end of their shoulder season. Um, this is, and, and I put this on here because lots of people, when they go to Norway and they want to see the fjords, they end up doing a, a cruise. There are lots and lots of cruises. And I would say, you know, instead rent a car and take a road trip because you have just as much flex, you have way more flexibility actually. And you have just as beautiful views, um, of the fjords and can have those same experiences that you would have on a cruise ship, but have more control, I would say. Um, and there's fewer people, you know, doing it by car than by cruise ship. One of the places that we went into actually was a popular port in one of the fjords. And we were driving in that day. And that day, three cruise ships landed too. And that poor little town was just overtaken. And I thought, oh my God, like, I don't want anything to do with this. Um, uh, and as soon as the cruise ships left, it was just a nice little town. But so that's why I enjoy doing the road trip through there. It was easy driving. Roads are good. Very simple. And beautiful, beautiful views. Um, this is a new one that I've added because I did this during the pandemic in July. July and any time after July, I would say, is a great time to get into the Grand Canyon. Now, July will probably be hot. I will tell you that, but it's also cheaper. <laughs> so, you know, you got that to... to uh, balance out. I actually went, when I did mine, I went in September, um, but it was during COVID. So that's why I was able to get in then. Um, otherwise there is normally a wait list for this that can go up to a couple of years. 
the rafting the Grand Canyon is a whole different way to see it. You know, everyone goes to the Grand Canyon, looks at it from the top, maybe hikes down a little bit, but to be inside this Canyon for 10 days or however long and experience the life inside the Canyon is a completely different experience. You need to be a little bit outdoorsy for this one, obviously, because you're going to be camping every day. Um, but you camp, you have incredible food, you can swim in waterfalls, you do some really amazing and hard hikes, I would say, and you get to enjoy the river and the rapids. And as you can see from that top right corner, one of the things I think that surprises a lot of people, rafting in the Grand Canyon does not mean that you are doing the paddling. In fact, it's just way too technical of a river to do that unless you really know what you're doing. So you've got one guy there that's managing the raft and you're riding. So it's kind of just like just awesome, fun ride. <laughs> um, obviously there are very calm areas too, but the rapids are really fun, but you don't have to worry about you paddling, I guess I would say. I also have a little shout out to my home state, July and Crested Butte. I love Crested Butte. It's my favorite town really in Colorado, but July is wildflower season. Um, and it is the capital of wildflowers in Colorado. The other thing about Crested Butte is it is not along the main corridor of I-70, so it doesn't get nearly as much visitors in the summer. It, it does get a fair amount, but it's not like Breckenridge. I went to Breckenridge last summer and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe how many people are here. Um, but so Crested Butte is much quieter. Uh, it's always gaining in popularity all the time. But the other thing why I say July is they have a wildflower festival. They also have a fabulous July 4th really fun small town parade and, and stuff like that and great hiking at that time with all the flowers. So that's a good one. August, I'm going to take you to a uh, lesser visited national park, probably one of the top five least visited <laughs> national parks if I were to really look. And that is in Alaska. And it is called Lake Clark National Park. It is so remote that there are no roads that go into it. Um, this You had to actually take a float plane and fly into it, land on the water, <laughs> and, and go from there. I did a group hiking and kayaking trip through uh, Lake Clark. It was very outdoorsy, but absolutely incredible. Like I, It's just one of these pristine areas that is incredible. If you've ever heard of the name Dick Prenicky, he wrote a book. He had a show on PBS years and years ago. Um, we actually kind of, the whole point of this trip was to make a pilgrimage to his cabin, which was in the middle of nowhere in this park. And he was quintessential basically, or, or uh, the main person that made this a national park. So there's a whole story behind Dick Prenicky. And it was just, it was just a fun purpose to kind of guide our way through. And we had inflatable kayaks and, and camped and you will absolutely see bears. Um, this is a very remote park. So really a fun option. And speaking of bears, as an alternative to Alaska and where most people go, which is Katmai, uh, to see bears, if you ever wanted to see grizzlies, um, a very unknown alternative is in Bella Coola, Canada. Um, so this is up in British Columbia, in Canada, in an area, in fact, it's called the gateway to the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, most people don't even know that there is a Great Bear Rainforest, and it is it is a stunning place to go. Um, as you can see, uh, I often, uh, recommend this as an alternative to even New Zealand as a kind of a cheaper alternative to New Zealand, not as long of a, a flight, um, because the fjords here are stunning and it just, when I was there, it reminded me of New Zealand, but here they have bears and lots of them. So if you want to do that kind of quintessential bear watching trip, you can do that here. You would fly from Vancouver on a small plane into Bella Coola. There's also a really great indigenous culture here that's fascinating. Um, this picture in the lower left is like, I don't know, like a thousand year old cedar tree. It was the biggest tree I've ever seen in my life. It was really, really incredible. So really beautiful area. Also in September, one of my favorite places, Ireland. Um, Ireland in June, July, and August, very, very busy. Uh, Ireland in September and October, not many people there. In fact, it's kind of shutting down. Um, so it's a great time to go. All of these pictures that you see here are from September or October. So yes, is it a little bit cooler? Could it rain? Yeah. But once again, you take the right gear 
and you just go. Um, so, you know, eventually you'll have a, <laughs> you'll have a sunny day or maybe you'll have all sunny days, but it's a really great time to go. It, like I said, it is a little cooler, but way fewer people, um, and easier to get places to stay and so on. Now I've only gone in September and October. I actually have two tours though, this year that I'm running in April. So it's the first time I've ever done Ireland in April and May. But once again, that's also shoulder season. It's just on the other side. So it'll be in the spring there. Um, I mentioned that only because I had a very last minute opening for one of them. Uh, it is the County Mayo hiking and culture tour. So one week long. And um, if you are interested, just email me. I have one spot available that just became available. It's very small. There's only six of us. So it's really small and super cultural. It's really fun. Anyway, so uh, so I mentioned that, but Ireland in September is the time to go for sure. Uh, an epic trip in October. And this is probably one of the most remote, cult culturally remote, I would say, places I've ever been in my life. And I did this a couple of years ago or a year ago uh, in the South Pacific. So this is a expedition cruise with heritage uh, ex um, expeditions. Um, so a hundred and so 120 or so people on the ship um, that stops at remote, remote islands in the South Pacific. So this is Papua New Guinea, um, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands we all went to. The wildlife is absolutely stunning. The bird life is epic. And, but most of all, what I was most interested in was the culture and the different tribes. Most of the, the 14 islands that we stopped at, and there's no ports at all. In fact, there's, there's no electricity, there's no plumbing, there's no anything. You know, you can anchor a small ship like this and then take these um, Zodiac rafts into shore. So that's how we would get to these remote islands. Most of them hadn't had visitors for anywhere from two to six years. Um, so if you really want to get off the beaten track and see, feel like you've went back in a time machine, this is it. Um, and this is the kind of stuff I love. In addition to all of this, there's also incredible snorkeling and diving and all that kind of stuff too, of course. So, but we also on this trip, never saw another ship, never saw any other tourists, um, and I was on that ship for 17 days. So that was pretty cool. Also in October, Japan. Um, I'm actually working on an article about this right now. Um, Japan is having a lot of trouble with overtourism. They have had a record number of visitors this year and since the pandemic or since they reopened, I should say. And it is worth it. Japan is an amazing country and I love it for so many reasons. But it is super crowded um, unless you can figure out how to get off the beaten path. So um, October is a great time to go. One of the things that lots of people don't know about Japan, they think about Tokyo or the big cities and all the you know skyscrapers and the millions and millions of people. And yes, that exists. But much of the islands are nature. I have never seen so many trees, dense, dense trees. I, I mean, I don't know. It kind of reminds me of like, the Eastern seaboard or the Eastern like national parks in, in the United States a little bit. There are so many trees and with trees means that October is a really great time because you get fall foliage. So it's not talked about that often in Japan, which I think is really weird. Um, but it's a great place to go in October. It will be cooler. It has a, a what do I want to say? A weather system kind of like the United States, um, so it will definitely be cooler at that time, but it's great for hiking, um, and to see the fall foliage and the, the cities won't be quite as busy either. Um, I am also working on a tour there for some time in Japan coming up, um, that really takes you off the beaten track. Like you still go to Tokyo, but then other than that, it's getting you to places that just really most people haven't heard of, um, which is great. It's, it's gives you a lot of opportunities to really engage with the culture and the locals. Um, so, and to try one of my favorite things to do, if you followed me on my last trip was to try all the cocktails and the mixology. <laughs> um, November, my epic trip in here, I always put in the polar bear spotting in Churchill, Canada. 
Um, it's probably the best place to see polar bears. And in November, normally end of October, beginning of November is the time where the polar bears are coming from inland out to the shore because the bay is freezing over and they're waiting for it to freeze over so they can go out on the ice and hunt and live their winter. Um, so what mean, that means that they all kind of start congregating toward the coast. And that is why this is such a great time to go up to Churchill because there will be hundreds and hundreds of bears there. Um, and there are so many different companies that offer different ways. Some let you walk and see the bears, which sounds really terrifying. Uh, the one here, the picture on the left is how I did it, which was a tundra buggy. Um, so it's just a really fascinating environment in general. Uh, but it's, yeah, Churchill itself, I was there for Halloween and they have like a whole polar bear watch for the kids to go out and, and trick or treat, which was really fascinating to me. Um, so uh, another November place that's not quite as expensive probably as polar bears is Northern Argentina and Chile. So this is, they are getting into their summer um, in Northern Argentina and Chile is kind of, you know, Patagonia is basically Southern Argentina and Chile. Uh, but Northern is more uh, desert and really crazy landscapes, less like towery mountains like is down South. But as you can see from these pictures, it's desert. So in Argentina, it's the Atacama Desert, which you might've heard of. Beautiful dark skies for, um, they have a bunch of like telescopes and stuff there. So great for um, star watching and stuff like that. Really incredible hikes, as you can see, you know, sand dunes, and it, it looks like you're on another planet. Um, you also will encounter wildlife, wanakos, flamingos, um, you name it. So I just found the landscapes there to be so incredible. So on the Argentina side, it's Atacama Desert. On the, oh, I'm sorry, other way around. On the Chile side, it's the Atacama Desert. On the Argentina side, it's an area called Salta. And you can actually go to both, probably within the time that you're there. I did. You can take a bus up and over like an 11,000 foot road. Um, so it's it's all pretty cool, actually. And so that's the other thing is these deserts, they're high desert, they're high altitude deserts. So that also makes them really unique, I think. But that's a really great time to go. And then December, I put in here a safari. Now, granted, you can go on safari at any time of year, but December is actually a pretty good time to go. You might encounter some more rain, at least in South Africa, where I went, but it's also cheaper. You can also find, this is a good time to find deals um, in December for safaris. So I went to a company called Tanda. Um, it was a private game reserve, really beautiful uh, they do a lot of research. You could get involved in the research and track animals and, and so on and so forth. They have a whole also, um, uh, if you want to go lower budget, there's a way that you can actually volunteer there for X number of weeks and, and be there. Um, so lots of different options there, but I just wanted to bring that up as it's kind of a good off season time to do safari. That's not quite as expensive. Okay. That's my year. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, that was a lot of talking. Uh, how am I doing on time? Not too bad. Um, okay, do we have any questions? I'm trying to go through. Let me stop sharing the screen. We still have people with us, a few people with us. Thank you. Um, let's see. Any questions? You can also unmute and just talk. That is absolutely fine if you have questions. Uh, I do see a question here. Is that blue whale season? I'm guessing... That was probably the question about the Sea of Cortez. Yeah, uh, that was. Yeah, they just they just did a um a documentary at the Natural History Museum here in New York on blue whales, and they were in the Sea of Cortez. So that's why I asked. Yeah, these were gray whales. And by the way, it's Lisa, right? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen you forever, <laughs> Lisa. I met Lisa on a trip to Greenland. <laughs> um. Uh. Uh. Yeah, I think the ones there that I saw, so different whales come at different times in mm -hmm. the Sea of Cortez. So there's a point where they have a bunch of um, whale sharks. So you can kind of, I, I want to say this lightly, swim with whale sharks. There's a whole bunch of regulations around it, obviously, but you know they do whatever they can within the regulations there. So whale sharks come. When I went, which was in February, it was gray whale season. And we... We were on the ship and we took a van 
across the Baja Peninsula, which is about an hour drive, and went over to where all the gray whales were. And they were, it's their calving area, basically. And it was the most spectacular whale watching I've ever done in my life. And I've been a lot of places whale watching because I called it people watching. Those whales came to you. And it was the weirdest, weirdest thing ever I've experienced. Um, the mothers, they say, they've tried to do all the research, but they say that the mothers are trying to teach the babies, the new calves, about boats and humans. That's their best explanation for it. But the whales actually come to your boat and like come right up. Like it's insane. So if you are a big wildlife person and you want spectacular whale watching, Sea of Cortez and that area is really great. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, oh, we have someone, someone asked if I've been to Ecuador. Yes. Um, oh, Don asked if I've been to Ecuador. Um, yes. Uh, I went to the Galapagos and I did that in November, which was also a really good time. Yeah. I would say I'd have to go back and look specifically at, you know, the, the travel times, but I went in November and it was great. Is it an expensive area? Do you know? Or... You go to the Galapagos, yeah. you've got a whole range of prices okay. probably, right? Like yeah. you can find cheaper ships. They're not going to be as fancy, but that's fine. They're all yeah. going to land on the islands and you're going to see incredible animals and wildlife. Right. Um, I also spent a few days in Quito in Ecuador, which is a really fascinating city, as well as uh, a lodge in the rainforest called Mashpi. Um which that's more expensive, but it was a really cool right. ecological trip. Like yeah. just stunning rainforest, like just thick, thick rainforest to, to hike around and learn about and swim in waterfalls and that kind of stuff. So they've got a bunch of different landscapes, I would say in Ecuador for that. That's great. So I just recently came upon you somewhere oh. on the internet. And <laughs> so you spend your year traveling with organizing groups or traveling on your own or both or both. both. So both. historically I started as a travel blogger back in 2006 with my blog. Um, and there I was just doing my own travel um, and writing about it. However, in the last probably four or five years, four years, I've started doing my own offering my own tours. So mm -hmm. I only do about four or five a year and they're very mm -hmm. small groups and they're to places that I love. Mm -hmm. uh, and normally the lesser known places yeah. get away with that. And uh, yeah, so right now I'm doing, in fact, next week I'm leaving for one in, in um, El Salvador. And uh, I run a couple in Ireland. And then I'm, like I said, I'm trying to do one in Patagonia for the e-biking and then probably a Japan and Alaska again next year. So that's great. Yeah. Well, you got the, the life everyone dreams of traveling for a <laughs> It's pretty great. I will say that. <laughs> it sounds great. I'm glad I found you. Well, thank you. Thank you for finding me. Tell others. Um, let's see. Someone interested in the Cami de Ronda, Mary. Uh, how long does it take? So it, I was with my dad. It took a good two weeks, I would say. Um, I want to say it was like 130, 136 miles, something like that total. Um, if you do the full thing. But once again, you can do little sections. You can do a three day, a five day, whatever. Um, but it is, as I mentioned briefly, it's a harder hike than the Camino de Santiago. The Camino de Santiago is to me more of a long distance walk. Um, you're not scrambling. You don't really have altitude, whereas you don't have altitude in the Cami de Ronda, but you do have, it's a much more rugged trail. Lots more. I just, I just, did, I just finished it. I just finished the Great Divide Trail, which is the northern half of the Continental Divide. Yep. So I guarantee you, this is nothing. I'm sure. You're right. But, uh, You're right. <laughs> but, but what I'm looking for is uh, something other than a tent at the end of the day, maybe, you know. Oh, yeah. I did not. I am. So I am of the age at this point <laughs> where I would much rather sleep in a hotel. Um, so when I did the Cami de Ronda, there are companies. And if you email me, I can email you some information. There's some really great companies that will help you organize all of the lodging and you just stay in these little fishing villages, you know, they're guest okay. houses and stuff. They're basic. Okay. You can stay in really nice places too. You can okay. stay in basic places and they will also move your luggage. Mm -hmm. So all you have to hike with is a day pack, which is really nice. Okay. Um, so there are companies that will absolutely do that for you along the Camino <laughs> that are good that I would recommend. 
and we had that done when I, cause I went with my dad and that's what we did. We stayed in hotels and had our luggage. Mm -hmm. moved. Okay. So, okay. Really good. I mean, I, I don't mind packing these. We did 300 kilometers with all of our food and stuff for two weeks. So it was like a bit of a, bit of a, a stretch, but yes, I kind of want to do something else. <laughs> well, yeah. And it, I will say because the Costa Brava is, it has such great food. Like you should definitely take a few days and enjoy some of that too. You know, like instead of cooking for yourself all the time or whatever, it's a, it's a really special place for seafood, especially. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah. And I also, like I said, if you want to email me, I have a whole ebook I can send you on the Cami Deranda that I wrote. Um, so it's kind of what my dad and I did and advice and so on and so forth. So I'm happy to send that your way. Um, Let's see, any tips about traveling around Peru? Oh, specifically Cusco. Uh, I have been to Peru two or three times and Machu Picchu. Um, I have always gone with a small group, um, like a small group tour. So I've not done it independently. So the hikes and stuff that I've done around there have been within the itinerary of the small group. Um, I did one year, one year I did the Inca Trail. Uh, which you have to sign up for pretty early um, because it will get filled up the three days to get to Machu Picchu. One year uh, I went with my niece and we did a trail called the Quarry Trail, which was an alternative to the Inca Trail. And it went up just as high, if not higher in altitude, actually. And it was the area that they quarried all the rocks from and then took to Machu Picchu. So it was kind of a different look at Machu Picchu in a way. I mean, there wasn't any old ruins like, you know, but as mm -hmm. part of that too, we hiked the quarry trail and then um, we ended up going to Machu Picchu and obviously seeing Machu Picchu too. We just didn't hike into Machu Picchu. So there's options like that. The other thing I would say around that area, if you want to get off the beaten track is, um, what's it called? The Lodges of Peru, I think, or um, they're really great. They do all these different treks around that area. And then you can stay in a nice lodge. Um, granted it's going to be a little bit more, it's, you know, nice food at the end of the day, all of that kind of stuff. So that's a, another kind of option to not do the normal, I would say in, in Peru. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Did you have any other questions about that? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure if I'm even going to Peru because I'm a teacher. And so the last six years I've been traveling and just yeah. doing what people call your bucket list. And um, so I think I've never been to South America and I'm like, it's just time to go. I, I was gonna, <laughs> I thought I was going last summer and I was doing research and everything and didn't work out. So I'm like, just go. And yeah. um and I was like, well, that's kind of a lot going to, you know, Chile, Argentina and, and Uruguay. And Uruguay might just be, be. you know, Montevideo. But I thought, well, sh uh, people are like, you have to go see Machu Picchu. And so I'm like, I don't know the way I travel. I could probably do all four. <laughs> but wow, that sounds like we'll a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, but you could also just do Chile. Yeah. Because you could do North which is like the desert, the high desert, the Atacama, which is fascinating, which is completely different than the South, um, which is Patagonia. So, you know, there's a lot you could do just in that country that would be very different because it's the skinny, narrow, long country. And Santiago, the, the capital city is also really, really beautiful. It reminds me a lot of Denver, but prettier actually. Um, so, in my world, that would be a lot to do all of that at once. But I also understand that not everyone has the luxury of time that I do mm -hmm. to go travel. So um, could you do all of those things? Yes, I think it would be hard. Yeah. It would be really racing through. Yeah. But maybe you race through it and then you go back and stay longer mm -hmm. another time to see what you like. Um, I have a, a follow-up for your question. Uh -huh. um, I've done much. Thank God I did it when I was younger. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Have you seen the Nazca lines? Is that something that's worth going to go see? So, no, I haven't seen it. So I don't even know what that is. <laughs> um, is like hieroglyphics. Like you remember those like crop circles that oh, yeah, yeah. they had? So it's sort of like that, except they're like much more ancient. 
and you have to like go and take like a little dilapidated Cessna up and they'll like take you over them to see them. And it was something I wanted to fit in when I did my Machu Picchu trip and I just didn't have enough time because it was in another part of Peru. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll put a, the name of it and how to spell yeah. it in the chat. I'll have to look at it. But yeah, no, I have not done that. So I'm, I'm sorry. I'm no help there. <laughs> my, my Peru bucket list. So maybe Karen. Yeah. Can... <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds how, interesting. I love it. How was well, that Inca trail, by the way? Because I'm wondering if I, you know, if I did go to Peru and just did like um, Cusco, you know, for, I don't know, a week, whatever. Um I'm wondering like if I should just take the train up or if I should actually do the Inca trail. The Inca trail is a, is a, I would say moderate to hard hike. Um, it's a lot of up and down and it can be slippery and lots of stairs because it can rain a lot. It it's only three days. And I think it goes as high as around 10 or 11,000 feet, which isn't crazy, but it's enough to really mess with people unless maybe you live in Colorado. Um, so the other thing about it, I mean, it's beautiful and it's a, it's a really authentic way to go in a way. Right. And so you have, that is really cool. It is very much roughing it. There is, that is camping and, you know, people, porters carrying your stuff, your heaviest stuff in the camp and stuff like that. There are no like options for lodging is what I would say. So as long as you're cool with that, it's a great trip. So yeah. I mean, I would, I would tell anyone to go do it, but I just always want to know what people, you know, so you know, kind of what you're getting yourself into. It, it's not an easy slam dunk hike. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jackie asking about Idaho. Ah, oh, that's an area I haven't been to Jackie. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someone else here has, but <laughs> I yeah, know. I'm going to see Anna in Portland, my son in Seattle, and I thought yeah. I'd go along that south stretch and stay there a little bit, but I don't know enough either, so if you, you learn something, let me know. <laughs> well, it's funny because that's one of my capital routes for biking, and I have to, so I will be very familiar with it, but maybe not this year, because <laughs> um, I have to okay. bike from Salt Lake to Boise, I think, so, but I might be able to find some people that that do, do have information on that though, because it is supposed to be really beautiful. I bet Vicky yeah, has some information. That'd be cool. On Anything you got, that'd be great. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Lots of stairs. Okay. Southern Peru. Okay. Any other? Have I missed anything? Anyone? Um. Yeah, sure. I'm just curious, best way to find out about your trips, like um, if you are going to go down to Patagonia, um, <laughs> do people usually sign up on your website or email you ahead of time or yes. that kind of so thing? The best way is going to be, I have, and I'll send this in the, the follow-up email, is a link to my, I kind of have an Ots World Tour newsletter. So every time I um, announce a tour, because they are small, so some of them do go fast. Some don't, but, um, uh, I will send an email to that group first, the news, it, those people get notified first. And then I normally do that for one day, maybe two. And then I announce it out in my other email and on social media and all that kind of stuff. So you have a chance to kind of get a jump. Um, however, also I'm, I'm not a big company. So like, if it's something that you know, that you're super interested in and you want to just give me a heads up and you're like, yeah, this is something I want to do. I can also send you an email when it's ready and you can take a look at it and decide. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. I'll email you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not a big Thanks corporate. A lot. It's just <laughs> I just wanted to put a um, shout out to you because you recommended um, Ireland uh, walk, hike and bike to us. We went on our own and it was awesome. You know, oh, good. Um, yeah, we were there for about uh, three and a half weeks and did oh. um, an eight day hike and following their instructions and they were a local company because we yeah. were looking probably something that was a little bigger and it was so nice to go with someone based in Tralee. Yeah. So, great. Oh, that's so great to hear. And here's something that you probably didn't know. I actually, I just started this last year. I work for them. I run their social media now. <laughs> that's great. So I will they pass are lovely. Them. Yeah. They're Morris, lovely. who's the owner, is a really good friend of mine. So the um the the tours that I do in Ireland are through them. 
yeah. them yeah. or yeah. Um, Rachel, who I met through them. Yeah. Um, and this year I'm doing, which I've never done before. It's filled up right now, but the carry way hike, which is like uh, 120 yeah. miles in nine saw days. That. Yeah. Saw that. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to do it, but yeah, we did dingle and, uh, and yeah, but did a little bit of carry anyway. Awesome. 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 I'd go back. <laughs> 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 thank you for everything i'm gonna sign yeah, on yeah yeah i'll be in touch. um someone jackie said that stanley idaho is gorgeous redfish lakes area i don't know okay. who that was vicky look at that vicky did you leave that yep i knew it jackie and vicky you two need to meet <laughs> all right stanley idaho I'll put it, yep look it up on my route thank you yeah um karen she's 11 to from in iowa Ooh, i love it we've got resume or we got recommendations for iowa and minnesota i live in minnesota oh that's awesome that is awesome best best way to get off the beaten path and local advice is <laughs> stuff like that so any other questions i have one more question yeah um so i just booked a, i just booked a long weekend in Austin, where I've never been, to go see the solar eclipse on April 8th. My Did question you say Austin is Austin or Boston? Austin, Texas. Um, okay. Because the solar, yeah. So my question is are there other places where, um, you know, there's a seasonality to seeing a particular natural thing that you have found to be worth it? So, like, a lot of people go to Amsterdam to see the tulips, like, in the spring. Like, Things like that, where a lot of people flock, you know, and if it's going to be like that picture you had of the Trevi Fountain, <laughs> probably not worth it. Is there anything over the course of your travels where you have found, you know, I don't know, the balloon festival in Albuquerque, like things like that, that are like mm -hmm. seasonal, um, that are actually worthwhile? Yes, there's lots of stuff. The hard part for me right now is coming up with it off the top of my head. But yes, the short answer is yes. Paper. <laughs> I might have to follow up on that one. But yeah. like when you said the tulips, that, that's a good example. Um, there are tons of people there though. Uh, I've just, I've got to give that some thought. Well, you could say yeah. it for a blog. It's okay. just something. Well, I can also write you. I mean, like I'm thinking for flowers, I can tell you right now that one of my favorite places is Girona, which is in Costa Brava, Spain. And that's, oh. in May. they have this incredible flower festival. It is, it can be crowded unless you stay in the medieval city and then you just get up early before the crowds come and, and cause it's all over the city, the flower, um, uh, what do I want to say displays and they're mm -hmm. incredible, mm -hmm. but, but I know there's other ones. I just have to give that some thought. So. Yeah. Another, I guess another example, and this is more of a monthly example or maybe a couple times a year. I went to um, Mont Saint Michel last year, and mm -hmm. I booked it. And then I found out that like you have to be very careful about when the moon tides are in order to see the pictures you see. Yeah. So I, I guess my question, what boils down to, when you're thinking about going on your bucket list, are there any places where the timing matters? Okay, let me give that some thought. I got okay. that because I know that I have answers for it. Um, but yeah, I just need to think it through a little bit. I'm sure tonight I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night and be like, that place. 